podcast. I am Kimberly Walsh, and I'm here with my partners in crime, the magnificent Andy Panda Bernstein. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> and the wonderful Chris Perry Long. Good morning. Just a quick background on us. Um, Chris has been working in this industry for many years, dedicating herself to working with families and helping people get into treatment. And Andy has been an advocate for mental health and addiction, both as the cross producer for or the producer for Crosscheck Radio, as well as through his own experiences. Um, as for me, I am a person in long-term recovery and the founder of a sober home for women called Little Sandy. We put this podcast together because all three of us are passionate about reducing the stigma around mental health and addiction. We believe that the more light we shed on these topics, the less people will stigmatize and punish those who suffer from mental illness and addiction. We hope the information we provide and the topics we discuss will help encourage people to seek treatment. Thanks to uh, Foxborough Cable Access TV, we now have the ability to take your questions live during the show. Um, so feel free to write in. Um, also, we now have all of our episodes available on iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn. So please post and share the show with your followers and don't forget to tag your friends. Um, okay, guys, let's check in. Um, we'll start with Panda. I know Chris is posting right now. <laughs> this has about been the wackiest. This has been about the wackiest morning I have had since the COVID has begun. Um, lots going on, um, but busy, really busy in the COVID. I'm busier than I wouldn't be if not in the COVID. So I don't know why that is, but I'm busy. Pretty good. That's where I stand. Nice. <laughs> How about you, Chris? Uh, I'm a little aggravated uh, this morning because um, I haven't been receiving my unemployment for the last month. And it's been great. It's been green, which they keep telling me, you know, oh, it's fine. It's fine. Well, this morning I checked and it went red. And when it goes red, I guess they don't believe I am who I am. So at 54 years old, I guess I have identity crisis. I don't know. So now I get to wait and listen to the automated um, message that I could probably recite uh, and try to figure out who I am. So, you know, maybe come are we all Wednesday. Aren't we all really trying right. to figure out who we are anyway? So After next Wednesday, I might not be who I am. I don't know. <laughs> the struggle is real. The struggle, the struggle is real. Is real. <laughs> the str- <laughs> right. Well, guys, did How you How are know? you, Kimberly? I'm good. Thank you for asking. Did you know that today it's actually going to be, it looks so dreary out, but it's going to be 82 degrees. Did you guys Yay! Know 82. I love Amazing. it. Amazing. Love it. I love love it. it. So I just wanted to share something with you guys. So last show... Chris shared about her ex-husband cheating and Andy has no problem sharing pieces of himself and then struggles he's having, you know, me, not so much. I think it may be the Irish Catholic upbringing or um, just been burned or whatever. So I was searching on YouTube and I found Brene Brown and she's just awesome. And uh, so I realized yesterday um, that we had this like kind of an emotional group session here with the girls. And we realized that that speaking one's truth, regardless of the fear, and regardless that people may judge you, is really nothing short of courageous. So being vulnerable is courageous. Um, and that's something that Brene Brown has researched extensively. And uh, she also looked at the anatomy of trust, which I, I think I'd like to do next, next show when we can have a graphic up. But it's very, um, it was very interesting about the qualities that, that make up trust in a relationship in any relationship Go ahead. she has a ted talk about she has a ted talk about that vulnerability yes. that's how i discovered her was from that and uh and if i may piggyback on what you said she actually talks about how that actually furthers relationships and strengthens it by the vulnerability and being being out there and, and sharing your story now i didn't realize that at the time but it was really funny i just wanted to interject i had a boss and she drove me crazy. Now, I'm not an easy person to work for or haven't been. She drove me nuts. Couldn't connect with her. She flipped it on me. She flipped the script, and she started being vulnerable. And you know what? It made me want to help her. Not fix it, but I became on her team because she was real with me. Yeah. And I knew that she had... Um, challenges and issues and 
personal stuff and professional stuff. And it was like, okay, she made herself more human to me. And therefore mm -hmm. I warmed up to her. She cracked the code with me. Mm -hmm. So um, to your point, that's uh, yeah. kind of a Brene Brown kind of thing. That's a great analogy. It's a perfect, perfect, you know, example of exactly what, I'm, what she's talking about, what I'm talking about. Um, and like I said, her newest one is on trust. Hello. <laughs> Chris is with the yeah, I'm on baby friends. duty today. So um, I'll be muting and non-muting and uh, probably jumping up and down. And um, yeah, it's one of those Fridays. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So um, at any rate, so I think I want to go back, but we'll, we can spend some more time on that next show, but I just kind of wanted to introduce it and, and also say that while we journal and we, you know, whatever we do with our issues, our internal struggles, is, um, you know, it's, it's going to be different for everybody. But I think that when we speak it, when we speak our truths, it takes, it does a couple of things. While it, it makes us connect with other people and it, um, it takes the power out of it. So a lot of it, you know, when you can trust someone and you can be vulnerable and you say it out loud, oh, it kind of takes that charge out of it a little bit. So Because um, honestly, people see through it. If you're not honest, they, they think you're, you know, you're almost emotionally dishonest or whatever. Like you don't keep it real with them. Cause I always felt like my boss was insincere and I right. shut down. I shut down. Um, and I also wanted to add, cause I love Brene Brown. The, the other thing I wanted to add was she talks about the man in the arena. Oh, the man in the arena that. is a Teddy Roosevelt quote that talks about, you know, the, the person on the, on the arena floor with the blood and the guts actually Le lebron james puts a quote on his shoes about it you can, you know there's criticism from the people in the cheap seats these aren't the people who are on the front lines they're not the battlers they don't have the blood and guts on them right the, the, which one do you admire more <laughs> right and the critics so it's like i mean basically it's like you could criticize me but you know what I'm on the floor. I'm in the man in the arena. You're up in the cheap seat. So what you say really doesn't matter until you right. walk a day in my shoes and be on the floor that I'm courageous enough to be out there. And that's why we, sh we need, you're right, Andy. And that's why we need to be kind because we don't know who's go what, what people are going through or how they process their own pain and what they're doing. We, we just don't know. And so your boss may have been going, maybe she just lost her, child. Maybe she lost her husband. Maybe she's just going through a rough time. And what she needs is compassion, not criticism. Um, right. So reaching out your hand is, is the, is the thing to do. It's the humane thing to do. Um, snickering and telling people she's a bad person is not, you know what I mean? We became, we became friends and we had a good relationship and I wanted her to help her succeed as a result of um, that relationship because she was vulnerable to me. And she opened up to me. And then as a person, I'm like, okay, she's not the enemy or she's not, she's the person who I can actually, uh, you know, I want to help her succeed because she's looking to me as a valuable member of her team that I can help her, you know? And, yeah. and then, so it wasn't, uh, but again, it's not fixing. It's just like, it's like just compassion. Yeah. Compassion. Come on yeah. my team, be on yep. my team. Well, you know, I, I'm working with a, a young man and a, a family, and um, he's about to get out of uh, treatment again. And he's already focusing on the negatives and the things that he really doesn't have control over. And, you know, I always encourage people to try to do it differently. Um, you know, let's do it differently. And one of the ways that we're going to work on on doing it differently is focusing on um, the positives, the good things, you know, his roommate, he enjoys fishing, his roommate enjoys fishing, you know, they'll have a little bit of commonality, um, focus on the things that you can control and not the things that you can't, because when we get consumed by the things that we can't control, we're defeated. So focus and on it's not the healthy. Right? It's not healthy. Right. Yeah. Right. So, it raises the cortisol levels in our, in our bodies, all kinds of stuff. But just, I was, just back to the trust thing real quick. The other piece of that, I, which I love that she said that, that there, he, there has to be non-judgment. You have to be able to feel like with, with another person, like you can fall apart and be struggling and, and know that they're not going to judge you. 
and vice versa, that they can fall apart and be struggling and, 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 not, and you have to not judge them. It's hard because we're human and we, and we get a self-satisfaction from helping others. I mean, how often, you know, would you prefer to help or be helped? <laughs> well, I'm going to, I'm going to add something to that because I, I am a, I am a very interested, I'm interested when it comes to this. Cause I talk about this all the time. First of all, two things. One, my wife told me I was negative. She says, you're so negative. Right. And I don't think of myself as negative, but last night she's like, you're, you're a pain to be around because you're so negative. And I'm like, and, and I'm not negative. I get frustrated with people who don't. And I pass judgment. I do on people who don't help themselves. If you help yourself, I'm all in. If you could tell me what you need help with, and I see that you're out trying to help yourself, which I've had to done in my, do my own life in my own life, I'm all in. But if you're not doing your own work, I judge that person. So mm-hmm. I need to stop that because I need to understand that you know. Some people aren't there yet. They can't get there yet. They're stuck. And rather than pass judgment, maybe it would be better to just like say, okay, that person's stuck and I'm going to be more tolerant of that person because I'm not. And I struggle with it because I'm like, I did it. I got through my stuff. I work on it. I walk, I, you know, I, I try to further myself all the time, but there's some people, they just aren't there yet. They're not there yet. And if that's not, doesn't make them bad or wrong, you know, no. um, the other, the other piece is accountability that, which means that they can make mistakes and own it and know that it's okay that they made a mistake, that, that you can move through that together. They make a mistake. They own it. You know, you don't hold it against them for the rest of their lives. I thought that was a big, a big piece too. And of course the integrity about holding in confidence. What I tell you, we have to know that I'm, that I'm able to speak to you, my mind, because I don't, you know, you don't do it with many people. So I've chosen you. You're going to hold my, what I share with you in confidence. And likewise, I will hold what you share with me in confidence. It's because it's nobody else's business. That builds trust, you know? So good. But you have to be careful on, I mean, you know, who you're, who, who you're going to, to share that with. Because you may not, Amen. you may not, you may miss that mark. You know, right? you, you're thinking, oh, that's the person I'm going to do that, you know, share that with. And. They might not be the right folk and you're, you were burned. Now that's on you, not you, Kimberly, both. but that's on both. You. Yeah. On both sides. Yeah. There's, you shouldn't have, shouldn't have shared with that person should have known better. Get obviously we've all known that person who goes, just tells everybody everything doesn't <laughs> with no filter, but uh, yeah. But you got to pick up on those signs. And then, so those signs like Brene Brown said, talks about her values, right? So in one of her books, and if you, understand that you have a value system and there, you know, there's things that people will do that maybe will question your values. Mm-hmm. And then you know that that's not the person to be telling right. things to. Right. right. Yeah. And, and you get duped sometimes and you think they're, yeah, I know I totally get it, but you got to watch who you're telling things to. And, and you know what, but there's also how, how else do you build trust, but by sharing certain things. Okay. Well, that didn't turn out so well, but you don't, you don't want to say that I'm not going to trust anybody else. You just kind of go to the next person and you just share less and you kind of wait, you know, right. Uh, I think that's right. the best, you know, that we can do. But at, at the end of the day, I think the bottom line, the, the theme here is just be kind. We don't know what people are going through. We don't know how they feel. Um, we don't know really um, what their struggles are um, and they don't know ours. So, you know, a reciprocal kindness I think is, is uh, needed. I go through this with my, I go through it because I'm going through a lot of this right now with my sister. She told me that my bar is too high for her and that I, I, I'm too hard on her. And I'm like, I'm like, well, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because she flitters about and she doesn't take action. And I get real frustrated with that after, you know, she went through a divorce, she went through a divorce six years ago. They're still trying to figure out everything they haven't done anything so it's like learned helplessness with my sister it's like every day it's the same thing it's like groundhog day every day it's the same stuff so i lose patience with her like can't you just do it because i'm a guy guys don't want to hear i don't want to hear venting i want to hear action (laughs) right i mean a lot of times my wife will listen and console her i'm not that guy 
I can be. Good to know your limitations. You know, yeah. it's good because then she won't be feeling like she didn't get what she needed and you won't be feeling like she's bugging, <laughs> continuing to say the same thing. Oh, it's torture. And it's like, so I said to her, I said to her yesterday, I said, well, can you help me do this, this, this? And she's in Baltimore. I go, well, what are you going to do for us? <laughs> Is what I said. What do you, because it's all about her. Me, 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 I, 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 I. It's frustrating. So sometimes you, um, you know, so yeah, I do pass judgment and I don't mean to when I want to work on that because I get, uh, I get frustrated. Mm. Well, I guess when we know better, we do better, right? Yeah, don't, don't, yeah. So don't make any mistakes because I'm going to pass judgment. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. God help us. Eggshells, eggshells. Um, yeah. That's good. Um, that's good stuff, it's, though. It is. It is. And um, uh, it's good that we're, we're working out know, to acknowledge it is the first step. And then you can work on it uh, and then you can make it better. So um, move a muscle. She's talking to her thought. agent. Is she talking to her agent right now? <laughs> Chris is on it. The, there she goes. Now they can see. <laughs> She's got other things. She's got stuff going on. Busy girl. She's helping people. I know. All right. So we got a good article that I wanted to uh, to bring up that Chris had an appointment, unless we're still talking about Brene. You are free to move on. What? If, but seriously, look up the TED Talk, Brene Brown, about vulnerability. She's she's awesome. And the newest she one is, on trust, the anatomy of trust. That's a it's the newest one, I think. Okay. Yeah. And she has podcasts and, and one of her books is called rising strong and fear. What is it? Uh, daring greatly. Daring greatly. Yeah. Check her out. She's, she's awesome. So good topic. Um, yeah. so we have an interesting article that Chris brought to our attention that, um, I'm going to share with everybody if I may. And, mm -hmm. um, if this comes to us from, Rochester, New York, and it's from WHAM, the ham TV in, in Rochester. <laughs> um, and they, they're doing something interesting around Narcan. So I'm going to share a, a, some quick snippets about this, and then we can meet our special guest, Kathy Collins. But um, in Rochester, this comes to us on Tuesday, June 9th, 65 fatal overdoses. Actually, here's the headline. Maisie's Law would require Narcan to be provided with opioid prescription. And in Rochester, 65 fatal overdoses this year in Monroe County, New York, compared to the same time period a year ago. March, April, and May saw a 60% spike in fatal overdoses. And health accounting leaders say that uh, the COVID pandemic has created challenges for those struggling with opioid addiction as they face isolation and distance from resources that have helped them in the past, which is no secret. We've discussed this as well. And, um, the county health, uh, executive or the county executive said those numbers make it clear that COVID-19 pandemic has taken a heavy toll on many people struggling with opioid addiction. So it's more important now to address the ongoing crisis. And we must aggressively pursue measures that reverses this disturbing trend and help our community overcome this epidemic in the long run. So, and I read it and then I had to read it again. And I'll tell you why. Uh, a new piece of legislation aims to help curb that trend. And they created Maisie's Law, which was introduced by the legislator. And it requires pharmacy to distribute at least one dose of Narcan with every opioid prescription unless the customer opts out in writing. And the idea is at very least to ensure that pharmacists will have a conversation about Narcan, which reverses the symptoms of an overdose. And they're hoping that this will um, provide awareness of a life-saving treatment um, and eliminate any embarrassment about having to ask for it and then put Narcan in places where it's needed. But the bill was introduced, hear me on this one, is Maisie Gillian. She died when she was nine months old after ingesting a stray methadone pill at a neighbor's home. So, so she was nine months, right? So the parents didn't keep, keep it away. So, um, so lock it up. Yeah. And the health commissioner, Michael Mendoza, praised the measure and said he hopes it can end the stigma around opioid addiction as well as Narcan and Naloxone. 
Um, and the legislation still needs to go through the process, but um, they're saying it's a good community uh, pro action to prevent fatality. So I'm going to throw that out to you guys. Um, since Chris is on the phone, I'm going to uh, throw it out to you, Kimberly. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, it's a good thing. It's going to save lives. I think that there is a responsibility that, that, you know, pharmacies, pharmaceuticals, doctors have when they prescribe these things. We were um, just watching a movie last night where when this whole thing started in the nineties and they started pushing, you know, big pharma started pushing these uh, drugs onto the doctors and saying, Hey, look, are you tired of your patients coming to you? And we're, we're complaining all the time. And they're, you know, my pain, this, my pain, that. And they said, what if, what if you could have something that gives you extended relief and it's non-addictive. And they just kept saying, it's, don't worry, it's non-addictive. And they would dole them out and they dole them out like candy. And then suddenly what happens? Okay. All of the overdoses, they get hooked on heroin. The whole cycle, you know, continues. And then they go, you know what? Let's make the reversal drug and we'll make money off that too. That's exactly what happened. So right. just, I mean, I see big pharma as literally the, the demon seed. They are Satan spawn. It's, it's just awful. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a responsibility they have. I hope they're meeting up to that responsibility. It sounds like, but they're still making money hand over fist and I don't see any donations coming to the, to help stop it entirely to not just put a bandaid on it. You know, there, yeah. You guys I mean, want to hear something on top of like, Oh, all you're, of back. This? you're I'm back. back. I'm back. Oh, Thank welcome you. I'm back. Okay. Sorry, no, no, no. sorry. 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 Hey, did Very you know busy. that Purdue is the producer of Suboxone? Of course they are. Oh my God. They also want to have their own clinic. Um, Right. Well, I know that, but, but they, so I'm like, I told you, I'm working, I learned this last night. I'm working on this uh, class action suit. Right. And I have people that um, had dabbled and they went to treatment, but they weren't like necessarily on a prescription. But then when they went to treatment, treatment jammed Suboxone down their throat and yeah. they became addicted because of the Suboxone because uh, for obvious reasons. And Purdue is the little maker of Suboxone. So Vertical people monopoly. that, yeah. So people that were, that people that were like became worse, I guess, and were prescribed Suboxone also fall into this uh, category for this class action suit. It's insane. Half the world's going to be on that, right? But anyway, so it's back to Maisie's law, right? That, that thing's pretty cool. It yeah. is cool, but it's a very it's very controversial um, because I've heard, you know, since I've been doing these, uh, since I've been doing these shows I, for three three years now, almost three years, scary. Um, I've learned that um, there's different schools. I thought, like, we had a guy on. His name is Mike Gimble, and he's down in Baltimore, and he's like a forefather in addiction uh, awareness and education. And Mike said it enables. That's what he thinks. He's mm -hmm. like, they have Narcan parties with it. Um, and well, that's a whole topic for a whole nother day, dude. Well, that's I know, I know, I know. But what, what, what the, the reality is, is it saves a life, right? Regardless, yeah. it saves a life. So what's the harm in it? There, there shouldn't be a harm. And, you know, no, we talk about judgment. Right. Well, no, but there's people out there who are definitely opposed to it. Um, in fact, Springfield, matter of fact, Springfield just started carrying Narcan. The police officers just started carrying Narcan in Springfield like a year ago, a year and a half ago. So while we think it's a little late coming to the party, aren't they? I mean, yeah, I know. But why we think that it's pretty, um, you know, it makes all the sense in the world. There's people for whatever reason, they have their own hangups with it. So they're not they're not embracing it, but, um, you know, and well, I, I don't know. They're, they're trying to say that the, I think they're trying to look what the opposition is trying to say is that, you know, if we make it so easy, it's like giving people needles and giving places to shoot right. up. There's right. no repercussions. They'll never hit a bottom and they'll never be able to bounce back and come in, you know, and get in get recovery. Cause it's just too easy. There's no, right. you know what I mean? So Chris is doing her jury imitation right now. She's walking in. <laughs> We're getting a tour of our I house. I need the peanut butter and jelly, you know. We what need can to I get say? a tour of our house. All right. 
Anyway, hey, we got to bring Kathy in. Let's get Kathy. We're going to bring Kathy. All right. She's, I'm a, she's a talker, you know. She's worse than all of us. All right. Just kidding, Kathy. Kathy, I'm going to do the honors and introduce her since you're uh, doing giving us a real estate tour around your house. Okay. Okay. All right. Kathy is the regional business development liaison for Spectrum Health Systems and is responsible for promoting New England recovery services. And she maintains business relationships and works with local hospitals, clinicians, and other referral services to help facilitate admission to New England recovery centers patients. She has an extensive background in addiction treatment, having worked with facilities across New England, and she has seen firsthand how addiction has affected our communities. So welcome, Kathy. Hey, Kath. You're on mute, Penny. Unmute. There you go. There we go. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Good. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thanks for How's coming on our mayhem this morning. <laughs> it's fascinating. How's pandemic treating you? Oh, not bad. Hang you guys busy? There. We are very, very busy. Busy lately. Um, I think sort of related to the statistics that Andy was giving. You know, people are uh, coming off of COVID, addicted to alcohol or drugs or having overdoses. I mean, I kind of see it happening in my own community. I'm also in long-term recovery. So I do see it as far as relapses go and that sort of thing. So tell us about um, kind of, can you give us a little bit about your personal story, if you'd be okay with that, or just sure, a little? Yeah, I'll be vulnerable, as Brene Brown would say. Um, Please. Yeah. <laughs> um, that was a good introduction, because I always feel that way um, about giving, you know, you have to be vulnerable if you're going to share your story, but like you said, to break the stigma. Um, so yes, I've been in recovery for 22 years this year. Congratulations. And, um, thank you. It's my biggest accomplishment in life is getting sober. And um, I'm still as active as I was when I started, which is um, to say I go to meetings. I, um, I'm in 12-step programs. And um, the good news about that is that is that I'm still doing what I can do and that the, due to the pandemic, I can do it in other fashions, you know, Zoom meetings, that sort of thing which you guys are, you know, very good at these days. Um, but I got sober when I was 34 and I got sober just because my life wasn't getting anywhere. You know, I was, uh, drinking and drugs, if they were around were just what I did because it was there and I was, uh, living and breathing to just drink every week. And it, um, it wasn't getting me anywhere. And I realized at one point, all the inside stuff was gone you know, the morals, the values, who I was as a person. And I just didn't want to be that way anymore. You know, I had dreams and all my dreams were sort of falling short. And um, so I reached a point where it's like, I can give it a try is what I thought. My therapist suggested it because I was in therapy for depression. And little did I know that really the alcohol had a huge part in it. Um, and I said to myself at that time, I can certainly... Um, drink again, but I might never get a shot at this again. So I gave it a shot. And uh, miraculously, when I went to uh, my first meeting, I heard what I needed to hear. And I didn't find it necessary to pick up again, which is phenomenal. I know it's not everyone's story. But um, I found such hope that first night that I, you know, I didn't need to go back out there and try again. And I hear from everyone what it's like. I don't really need to experiment again, because I know it's got not gotten any better. What did so, you hear? What did you hear that at that first meeting? Well, it was a simple little thing and I was, you know, a little mocha. So I was not really able to, um, uh, to hear anything really complicated. But what I heard was if you don't drink, your life gets better. And if you drink, your life gets worse. And um, literally it? it was simple. And that's what it's been for me, you know, and, and this many years later, all my dreams haven't come true, but I am so happy with where my life is that it, those dreams would have, you know, they weren't meant to be for me. I realized that God has a bigger plan and, you know, just because I wanted to have children doesn't mean I would have been a great mother. I don't know, you know, things like that I can accept today versus, you know, drinking over. 
right? Or feeling sorry for yourself or, totally you know, self-pity, you, yeah. right. So you've been able to, you've been able to kind of understand, like, it's not what you want. It's what you need. I'm going to quote the it, Rolling Stones. You can't, you can't know, get what I want. <laughs> right. But you get what you need. So you kind of have, you, you, you accept that. And, um, not to, you know, take everybody's, take all your time and start yapping, but, um, Tell us about how you got involved with Spectrum and what Spectrum's all about. Sure. Um, so I had been in sales for a number of years uh, in a completely different industry. And I said to myself at one point, what could I possibly do that I can be passionate about? And recovery is something that I'm very, very passionate about. I love helping people and I love my recovery. And mm -hmm. anything I can do to get another person at the same level of hope and feeling good about themselves, I, I will do. And um, so after 20 years in selling paper for a living, I decided that um, I didn't even realize this was a great industry that, you know, has people that do outreach, promote uh, facilities. So I hooked up with a facility. I hooked up with a few facilities. It took me a little while to get my footing. And um, really what I've realized and what I love about Spectrum more than anything, is the fact that I can help more people by working at a facility like this because they take all insurances, meaning they can go from public health all the way to commercial health, uh, commercial insurance. So every aspect is covered, which is what makes my job so much easier because, you know, there's a lot of, including DPH beds, which where someone has no insurance. And to me, that's the biggest gift and blessing. So Spectrum has inpatient and outpatient facilities, uh, 14 outpatient facilities where people can go and get mental health counseling, uh, medication assisted treatment, or you can go inpatient. We have a campus in Weymouth that is for males. We have a uh, campus in Westboro, which has Spectrum, which has an ATS and a CSS, which is the detox and residential for the public sector, as well as New England Recovery Center, which has um, detox and residential. And um, so we have a huge campus. We also have a young adult program, which is a little bit longer term. And Spectrum's been a little bit on the uh, front end of the curve where we have uh, an actual COVID unit. So if someone oh, is wow. po yeah, positive for COVID, there's a whole house dedicated to that with a whole team. And so we've been able to treat patients who are COVID positive. That is good to know. I've, got, I've actually got someone who's um, at another facility who's COVID positive and they had her at a hotel, which is not a good place for someone who is trying to <laughs> you know, yep. um, detox from alcohol. So um, that's great to know. I'm going to pass that. I will send so you the brochure. Yeah. And if anyone who has information on that can call, you know, any of you, I don't know if he put my number up, but um, you're more than welcome to call and um, we'll talk you through the process. But um, Spectrum has a number that's easy. 877-MY-REHAB. Uh, um, it's kind of easy to remember. And we, they can, you can go through there for your outpatient, for inpatient, whatever it is you're looking for, everything can be funneled through that number. Including the so when you go, um, you know, I actually ended up going to work for a treatment center and I left after two days because I, uh, it, it's a common, so it's a commonality, uh, Catherine, just to let you know. I was going to say, maybe it was the same one I was at. I was it was. <laughs> so, so I was there for two days. I'm not in recovery. Um, I'm on a journey, I would say. Um, so I'm reco everybody's recovering from something. I went, I went down there and went to the location. I went to the training and I was thoroughly turned off that I left. And I was really disappointed in the way that they um, looked at patients and look at people who were trying to get in recovery. Mm -hmm. um, and it became about heads and beds, um, <laughs> which I understand that that's a very real part of the business to be able to keep your doors open and keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. But the claims that they were making about how effective they were and a lot of the things that, um, you know, and I would question and I would get an answer like, don't worry about it. And a lot of people were in recovery in the, in the, 
that were employees. So, um, and, and my position was going to be a little different, but I was in a training with a lot of people in recovery. So I guess my point to you is, or my question to you is when you're approaching a doctor or a, um, a, a, um, a department, you know, a hospital, or, um, you're out talking to people, how do you separate spectrum from other people out there? What are some of the things that you highlight when you're speaking with, um, potential clients or potential referrals, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Nope. That's a great question. And I could probably put my finger on where you were talking about I think I attended that same training, <laughs> which makes me laugh. But I, I wrote down your email address so we could discuss later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we could trade war stories because yeah. uh, um, I was, I, I was really, you know, interestingly, I, just a quick aside, I was really on the fence about taking it, and I had talked to Chris about it, um, and I talked to Kimberly, and I went ahead and did it because the money was good. And Despite our warnings, <laughs> that don't do it. Don't well, you do know it. What, you won't be happy. <laughs> you know what though? Sometimes you have to. Sometimes you have to try things for yourself and not. You know. You know. Everybody gets a clean slate with me uh -huh. at the beginning, and so I try to block out to to form my own opinion. You didn't lie as advertised, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, so I guess that's my quick aside. But what 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 do you say? How do you position? Well, spectrum? for me, it's really easy to um, position Spectrum because of the services that they offer and the fact that they are, you know, nonprofit. It's easy to say nonprofit. We're not in it for making money, which I think is a huge differentiator. And things like we discussed offline before this call started. We have a terrific program director, clinical team, someone such as Mary Beth Adams, who comes. The best. Yeah, the best. And she comes with so much experience. She's been really able to develop programs and develop a team that is just the quality of her clinical care, I would say, is top notch now. And I think, you know, when I started, she wasn't there. And I think little by little, some of the players have changed. And I, honestly, I think it's the quality of care and the quality of response. Um, so if you're looking for help getting someone in, uh, I know me and my counterparts, you know, I have a couple of people I work with, we are super responsive. And we're always under the impression that if we're not a fit for you, we will help you find the fit for you. That it's more about helping the people than it is about heads on beds. That's not our model at all. And if need be, we would block admission so that we can give the people there the quality of care they need over um, understaffing for the uh, amount of patients, if that makes sense. So, yeah, and, I think, sense. and I think Wait. often, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, I just wanted to know, is Sue Pano still with you guys? Because she is an amazing human being. I just, she has represented Spectrum so well. I just, um, I just love her. She's awesome. I agree. Yes. She's my counterpart. I kind of cover, I live in Natick and cover sort of the um, metro westy, west of the state area. And Sue and I share Boston. And then she covers sort of South Shore and that. So, yeah, she's my counterpart. She's taught me everything I know about Spectrum. So, uh, yeah, we work closely together with David Nefesi, who uh, he hates when I say it, but he manages us or he tries. <laughs> <laughs> When, when, when you talk to, so with it being such a competitive field with so many different places, if someone, and I'm just from my own edification, if somebody says to you, oh, well, you know, they do, you know, like if somebody starts pitting you against another, you know, if another rep or another marketer or somebody else um, tries to, like if they start to criticize like like how do you how do you combat if somebody has talked bad about your company to a prospective um referral like how how do you address that if well, interestingly enough that hasn't happened oh um, good interesting you know but i can anticipate that it would probably happen that people but I have found that very rare in this industry where like, I wouldn't say anything negative about my competitors because they're helping people. 
whether they're helping people the way I would want to do it or not, or the way I would necessarily think it best. Um, I think anytime a person is in treatment and they're getting help, that's great. And I think every there's a place for everybody, much like um, there's a 12-step program or there's Celebrate Recovery. My way is not the only way. And I would say I'm happy to pitch, um, I'm happy to pitch us, but if I would never degrade another facility because it right. just it would not serve me well. And I don't, and I think that's the one thing about this industry. We're all so close to one another because we really only want the, the good ones. Let's just say the good ones. Right. We stay connected to each other because we want what's in the best interest of the patient. So, um, you know, guys chime in, but, um, I guess my, my other question is, is, um, from the treatment perspective, like what are some of the things that you focus specialize in? Is it dual diagnosis? Is it, you know, um, what are some of the key things? Cause not, there's one size fits all. Oh, look, Chris is raising her hand. Hi, Chris. Yeah. That dual hey. diagnosis thing. Come on now. We, Kathy and I talk about this a lot because people say they're dual diagnosis and you know, what classifies you as a dual diagnosis because you have a psych nurse practitioner that can uh, prescribe and that makes you dual diagnosis or do you have actual psych? Is your clients actually getting the psych to, uh, to get that dual diagnosis that, you know, right. that's a very gray area. And the place that you worked at first in Florida, Lakeview, mm -hmm. yes. Lakeview Health, that's pretty much a true dual diagnosis program, correct? Correct. correct. It's Lakeview Health in Jacksonville, Florida, I worked at, and um, they were terrific, and they have gender specific, um, which I love that. Like, there's many different things they offer. The, the hard part about working for them was the fact that they're in Florida, and I can't imagine what it's like right now being a rep for them in anywhere except Florida because nobody wants to get on a plane which has been, you know, the challenge. And that's one of the things that's easy to combat against locally is we are a local facility. Someone can call today and we can either pick them up if it's appropriate or they can get a ride there and be there today. And I always say, if you're making the call today, today's the day you want to be in there. Because the longer you delay, the more your mind, you change your mind. In, right. in my opinion, you take action while the fire's hot. Right, when exactly. You, you talk about insurance. Um, so if somebody wants to, so they call, they want to, mm -hmm. they, 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 they need help. Mm -hmm. They don't know what kind of insurance they have. They know they have, or what, what is covered? What isn't? Do you guys have a, someone who can walk them through that process? Absolutely. First thing we would do is find out their information, you know, date of birth, social, that sort of thing. And we'll look them up. If they have no insurance, good news is Spectrum does offer some DPH beds if they're available so that we can treat people with no insurance. Kathy, what's DPH? So, DPH, so like, Department of Public Health, they, meaning yeah. they're funded by the state so that we can help more people, which is also part of a wonderful thing about being a um, nonprofit because you get that sort of support. Um, so we have beds available for people with no insurance. Then we would talk someone through and figure out if they have mass health or if they have private insurance, whatever type of insurance they have. And there are some um, mass health products that are not considered, um, not considered, I don't know, public health. They're mass health, but they're really private insurance or more commercial, like a always health or a, um, oh, what's the other one? Uh, Tufts, yeah, thank you. Um, and th some of those go into the New England Recovery Center. So we have um, admission centers, admission intake people at Weymouth, which, is, as I said, is male, at Spectrum in Westboro, and as well as New England Recovery Center. So we have lots of people that can walk you through the process and do an intake and help you, you know, sort of get on board with the process. Okay. And um, is, is uh, like 12... So is it only, do you just uh, focus on 12 step or are there other? No, nope, we focus on all aspects of recovery. So you get different groups, you get relapse prevention, you get exposure to a variety of things such as 
um, celebrate recovery, smart recovery. You know, a lot of people are um, turned off by 12 step because of God. You know, okay, we meet the patient where they're at. And I know that's like a overused term, but we really do. If someone's offended by something, we will find them the niche for them. And that's another thing I would say that, you know, Mary Beth has done very well because she's made sure of it, that the, you know, the proper um, team and is with the patients that are having those issues. Kathy, do you okay. find that we do that too? We kind of offer 12 step or non 12 step refuge recovery, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but because of the, the way it, they're set up and, and it's, it, you know, you don't necessarily have a sponsor, you don't do the things that, that happen in a 12 step program. We, we found that they actually migrate back to, they end up, you know, migrating always. back to a, yeah, always. <laughs> okay. Always. That's what. And I also find that NA actually migrates a lot to AA because it seems, uh, I've heard, I've asked a lot of questions about it and I've done both, but I, I think AA tends to have a less stringent or militant attitude where some of the things like the medication assisted treatment in NA gets a tougher rap than it does in AA. And I think, mm -hmm. okay, but you know, think about who's more understanding. You think your own, your own people, but I mean, so there is a program and there is kindness for everyone in any of the recovery programs. Yeah. Whatever what gets you there. <laughs> what do you exactly. remember? What do you re recommend in the way of a stay? Like, uh, is it 30 days, 60 days, 90 well, days? I always recommend the longest length of stay your insurance will actually cover because the longer you can get away from from your family, your triggers, your whatever is out there. And I, and we always shoot for aftercare. So it's great to, you know, to know Kimberly because our greatest thing is we have, you know, great clinicians. Think so you think so you think <laughs> it's good to know I'm kidding. <laughs> it is great to know her. Um, yeah. And the longer um, we can get someone to stay engaged in their treatment, you know, if we step them into an outpatient or an IOP and we get them into sober housing, whatever we can do for them, we try to do because we know from, you know, evidence tells us the longer you can stay in treatment, the better off you are. 100%. I agree with that. 100%. Um, as far as, you know, I know a lot of, I've known a lot of treatment centers, they promote food, they promote their food <laughs> and they, I'm serious. I've heard that with food and um, free cigarettes, oh. massages. Oh, they do not free cigarettes. Yeah, yeah they do. Cigarettes, yeah, they do. massages, acupuncture, all those fun things. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm assuming that being a nonprofit and kind of being more of the, um, you know, probably more functional, less about mm -hmm. a spa and more probably. Um, is that a fair assessment that you probably don't well, really emphasize I, I, I that? I never promote the food. Honestly, <laughs> I've seen the food and it looks delicious and it smells delicious and the cafeteria is lovely. And I know that the beverages are ongoing. So, and there's snacks on all of the floors and people, I don't think people are struggling. I have been at a facility where they ixnade on the snacks and it was like a big revolt um but i think people need snacks people need candy and it is available there i've seen it on the floors myself and i while i don't promote the food i've never heard a bad word about it and i think it's funny because we do have a lovely gym but at the moment due to covid it's not accessible but we also have what i really like is an outdoor sort of zen garden where the 12 steps are posted around and you know the teams are trying to have meetings outside as much as possible group therapy group sessions that sort of thing so i think the atmosphere is really believe it or not it's more about what you get clinically than what that's what i'm getting. saying yeah right that's what i would pitch the clinical versus you know, not that it's a bad environment. I love it. I mean, it's very beautiful. It's not extravagant and I never pitch it as extravagant, but if someone is ready to get treatment and they're willing and they want to go, I'm, I would send my sister there. I mean, and that's always my barometer. My right. sister doesn't, doesn't have a problem, thankfully, but I would send a family member there without doubt. Okay. Exactly. That's what you always say. Would I send my family here? Are you yep. comfortable sending your family there? You know? Yep. That's important. Uh, anything else, guys? Um, I 
if somebody wanted to reach out to you and get in contact with you, can you give their information? Oh, absolutely. Um, Your information? My information, you can absolutely call me. Uh, My cell is 617-448-1531. And um, I'm at Spectrum. So you can, my email address is rather lengthy, but Chris, Kimberly, and you, I will get it to all of you. So if anyone wants to reach to you, you're happy to do that. And uh, happy to share my information with anyone because I, Literally, much like you guys, my goal is helping people get into treatment. That's awesome. And, and if you could, uh, if you could say to somebody out there right now, well, uh, let me back up. What are you seeing out there right now? What are the? Um, I'm assuming you're very busy right now. There's a lot of people. Um, you know what is the? What is the? Um, you know what are some of the things you're seeing out there as far as? Um, you know, from people's uh, struggles? Well, what I'm seeing and probably I would guess Kimberly would agree with this is alcohol. Alcohol consumption among women particularly Mm -hmm. is seemingly higher. And it could be because, you know, and I've heard it a million times, you know, I'm home with the children. You know, I need to have a drink or, you know, and I've seen it where alcohol consumption, you know, people think, they're self-medicating basically. And, you know, it's what I did for a number of years. So I don't judge that at all, but I think we reach a point as women where we quickly become alcoholic versus a man who can drink a little bit longer, a little bit more. And I think what do you think Kimberly? Oh, hundred percent. hundred percent. I've got a friend who's a, a, an ER doctor and he, he's, he says all the time, he's like, Kimberly, I see these women coming in your age, you know, and they're dying. They're dying in the ER, just yeah. waiting to get treatment because, you know, cirrhosis, other related. And, and we just, you know, we just, we kind of gloss over it because women are such a staple. They do, they need to get the kids. They need to take them to the, to the games. They need, you know, they have to cook the dinners. The men don't do that just yet. You know what I mean? I mean, some do, but, but yeah, they're, they're, they're too big of a piece of the family to allow them to go to treatment. So they just kind of, can you, I I totally agree. And I feel like even myself, you know, while I didn't have children when I got sober, I was very functional, never missed a day of work, never, you know, I I wrote wrote the book about how to be a great alcoholic. But in reality, I wasn't doing myself any favors. You know, my, I had bad liver levels when I got here. And, and I think it even says it in, um, the literature of Alcoholics Anonymous that women are have a propensity to get across the line much quicker than men. So I'm so grateful that I got it when I was 34. I mean, I wouldn't have the life I have today for sure. If I That's didn't. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, um, and this is women across the board, you know, talking to Kimberly and, you know, talking to my sister, she has a friend who, um, you know, it doesn't matter your age, your demographics, your psychographics, where you live, how much money you have, alcohol affects addiction affects us all or can mm-hmm. affect everyone. It doesn't discriminate, I guess. It does not discriminate at all. No. Yes. Well, yeah. Andy, did you, did you have any other questions? We're going to have to. No, no. Thank you, Kathy, yeah. for coming on. I really appreciate it. You're so welcome. Thank you guys. I, I really appreciate it. And I feel happy to have this connection with you guys now. Absolutely. You thank you. Thank you and, so uh, much, Kath. <laughs> tell, you. tell, tell MB. Hi. Oh, I will. I'll give her a copy of this podcast to listen to. Good. Great. Good. Great. Maybe we'll have her on too. You guys can come back. That'd be lovely. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, yep. Take Bye-bye. care. Bye. Well, everyone, I believe we lost Chris. Um, that's okay. But uh, we want to uh, thank Chris Kathy was very busy. Gonna... She, was she was very busy. busy. <laughs> very busy. <laughs> she was very yeah, busy. Children. It's just, just you and out. I, kid. It's that's just right. you and I. Yeah, Let's take right. her out, Andy. <laughs> Let's take her out. She's off. Well, that's right. our sh- that's no, our not show. No, not take her out. Week, right? Take the show out. <laughs> oh, well, you take us out. All right, all right, guys. Um, please always feel free to reach out to us on our Facebook page, The Map Twenty Twenty. Um, you could also email us at our Gmail account, which is in our show notes, um, and also check the show notes for for contact information uh, that was discussed regarding Kathy and Spectrum Health Systems. Um, thank you all for your support of our mission, and we will see you next Wednesday at eleven a.m. Same time, same place. Great. On the map. See you. Have a good weekend, map. everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.